a uh, good time. Just as a point of information, I do record this as we do it every week. Uh, what that enables me to do most of the time is that if you miss one of these, um, I can then uh, send you the link to the filmed version. So, um, you know, that makes it a little easier, I think, for some. And um, then that way you don't have to worry if you miss, what do you do? The only hang up to that is sometimes YouTube uh, makes me uh, go through some um, contortions about copyright and all of that kind of stuff. But 99% of the time they allow me to, to send it back out. So don't worry if you miss, uh, there might be a way for you to catch it otherwise. Okay, so let me flip my screen over. I'll move this and we'll start our uh, event. So the best bad characters, this is actually, you know, I, I was looking for a real interesting clip. This is Roddy McDowell, uh, who with Richard Burton created the part of Mordred uh, in the musical Camelot. And one of the interesting things I just learned uh, literally 20 minutes ago in an interview with Kitty Carlisle and Julie Andrews was that they wanted to really show that Lancelot and Guinevere were truly having an affair. And at the time in 1960, they thought that was far too lurid uh, for the audience and the purity of the story. Julie Andrews was horrified um, that they really didn't want to show that because they thought it made Guinevere look all too virginal. But yet Roddy McDowell's character of Mordred actually catches them in the act. And this is one of the problems with the Camelot script. It alludes to a whole lot of stuff uh, that doesn't really actually... Uh, hold water uh, in terms of the way it was written. Uh, but Mordred is certainly one of the great wicked characters of all times because he brings down a kingdom. But let's talk about Fagin uh, and um, Oliver. Oliver, uh, there's a comment. I do want to uh, read the chat just for, well, I can't really read the chat. So if you need to send me a text message, 301-529-5244, uh, then maybe I can answer that as we go. Um, in any event, uh, Fagin um, is a truly unsympathetic character. And the way that Dickens wrote Oliver Twist, uh, not only is he a horrible human being, but the anti-Semitic portrayal uh, was something that when Oliver was written and created, the first Dickens musical ever, um, that they really felt had to be portrayed in a comic sort of a way. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Oliver was the first British musical uh, that comes to the United States and really is a success. Prior to this time, British musicals just never really were successful. And David Merrick, who was nicknamed the Abominable uh, Showman, actually uh, toured Oliver across the United States for a year before bringing it to New York. And during that time period, a lot of the music uh, infiltrated the radio waves, as long as he needs me, of course, being one of the first. And after the Kennedy assassination, when uh, tickets were not selling well, uh, they put Georgia Brown on the Ed Sullivan show uh, to sing as long as he needs me to get people to buy tickets again. And of course, her performance had an interesting uh, night. It was the first night the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. And uh, they got such a, uh, um, they wanted to promote it so well that they actually played the song twice. And uh, Fagin uh, uh, has been uh, a great character to portray. And this is from a recent London uh, version of Oliver. some place to sleep tonight, don't you? Well, don't worry, I know just the place. Viking! You summoned me, dear boy. You summoned... I can smell rich pickings here tonight, don't you? <laughs> Who's this? Uh, I brought a new friend to see you. Oliver Twist. Oh. Sir... 
I expect you've come to London to seek your fortune, Master Twist. <laughs> well, we'll have to see what we can do to help you, eh, boys? Well, you see, Oliver, in this life, one thing counts. In the bank, large amounts. I'm afraid these don't grow on trees. You've got to pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Large amounts don't grow on trees. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Let's show Oliver how to do it, my dears. Yeah! Come on, Oliver, you stay there. Why should we break our backs stupidly paying tax? Better get some untaxed income. Better pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Watch and learn. Oh, I can Watch wait and learn. Oh, right now, backs. Better pick a pocket or two. <laughs> Who said crime doesn't pay? Robin Hood. What a crook gave away what he took. Charities fine, subscribe to mine. Get out and pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. Mister, you've got to pick a pocket or two. Bobby Duck was far too good. He had to pick a pocket or two. Merry men indeed. Take a tip. From Bill Sykes, he can whip what he likes. I recall he started small. He had to pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. Oh, you've got to pick a pocket or two. Passing by, something nice takes his eye. Everything's clear. Attack the rear. Get in and pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. Oh, I I'm naked now. You've got to pick a pocket or two. And the rear attack the rear. Get in and pick a pocket or two. When I see someone rich, most my thumbs start to itch. Only to find some peace of mind, you've got to pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. There, there, up down there, right, okay. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Come here. Just to find some peace of mind, we have to pick a pocket or two. Of course, the lovable evil thing. Now, uh, Cold Die and She Loves Me, you may not be as familiar with this. This is a musical that's actually based upon a play called The Perfumery, which was the basis for the movie uh, The Shop Around the Corner. Cold Die works in this particular uh, perfumery uh, in Budapest, and he's really a bad guy. He he romances all the women, but at the same time, he's having an affair with the boss's wife, uh, which causes a lot of other challenges for people who work in the uh, perfumery. And this is just his great farewell moment. Come with me, Ilona. I've missed you so much. Oh, God, no. How I envy you each evening when work is through For I have only me to be with while you have you No Without you Cold, my lonely life has grown. Are you happy alone, Ilona? Ilona, my own. Now that could die is hard at play. We'll never get out of here till New Year's Day. So happy.
mistletoe I long for someone Please tell me who Like some divine, divining rod It points straight to you Remember it, Lona Those sunny nights we knew Just say the word, Ilona. We'll know them once more. If it was only up to me, guess who I would hang upon the Christmas tree? This is where I came in, amen. The fox and the chicken are a team again. So Gavin Creel, who was the lead there, uh, actually also was in Hello, Dolly! The Revival on Broadway. And uh, he's done a great many. He was in Waitress. I mean, he's he's one of the classic uh, 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 Broadway characters right now that people really do look at. Now, one of the most evil characters that you could possibly come up with was the metaphor of what the MC in Cabaret became uh, for the evil that was Nazi Germany. Of course... Setting Cabaret, the Joe Masteroff book with the, with Kandra Neb music directed by Hal Prince, uh, really set a tone for dark musicals that uh, were starting to emerge in the 1960s. Musicals that didn't always have uh, happy endings. Uh, Cabaret was very unusual in its time, and there are so many truly performances of this. And the 1996 revival took it even uh, the evil a step further. Uh, Alan Cumming reimagining the role, making it even darker. It was far more sexual. And uh, obviously, this was from the 1996 revival. Uh, in London, they do an awful lot with immersive theater where the audience sits among the actors. Uh, and this time, Cabaret was actually set as if it were uh, in a cabaret and you were a part uh, of the metaphor yourself. Uh, this was from a filmed PBS version where Alan Cummings put his spin. You'll notice uh, the obvious drug use, the obvious bisexuality of the character, uh, most of which is really uh, very in your face and, and very disturbing as you think about where Cabaret goes uh, in its context. Pointing. Mm. I get it. We have no 
troubles here. Here, life is beautiful. The girls are beautiful. Even the orchestra is beautiful. You have to remember, uh, the original cabaret with Joel Grey, the character was hideous on its own, but Alan Cumming uh, took it to a far more hideous level, and the script uh, revisions that Joe Masteroff wrote to make it very clear uh, about the bisexuality of the characters only enhance the evil metaphor of what the cabaret represented, which was a, this nightclub that represented the German society in, in utter decadence and decay uh, that was descending into the moral abyss that it became as time went on. Now, Promises, Promises in 1968 uh, has an interesting background. 
Uh, Neil Simon, who wrote the script, had never met David Merrick. His producer was a, a, a man by the name of St. Suber. And uh, David Merrick invites uh, Neil Simon to lunch at Sardi's, as the story goes, and said to Neil Simon, you know, if you were to uh, take a movie and uh, turn it into a musical, what movie do you think it should be? And Neil Simon said, oh, for sure, The Apartment. The very cynical satire of life and rise in corporate America. Well, Neil, you know, if we were to do this, who do you think should write the music? Oh, without a doubt, Bacharach and David, the, the primary uh, songwriting success team that's out there right now. And Neil, you know, who would you get as a leading man if we were to do this? Oh, without a doubt, Jerry Orbach. He's just the perfect uh, actor to pull this off. He's young and cynical and perfect. Two weeks later, David Merrick calls Neil Simon and says, Neil, I got you everything you want. We can start writing the script. And Neil Simon was like flustered. He couldn't believe what happened. Well, of course, the story of Promises Promises, uh, based upon the apartment, uh, is the story of a young man who wants to get ahead in his corporation by letting the married men in his corporation use his apartment for a nightly flings with women who work in the corporation. Uh, and it doesn't go well. And the evil character in Promises Promises is the president of the corporation. Um, one of the things that was wrong with this revival was casting. Sean Hayes was not exactly believable uh, as Chuck Baxter, the center of the story. Uh, Kristen Chenoweth and he had no charisma together. Uh, uh, Tony Goldwyn played the bad guy. He's actually the, son, the grandson of Sam Goldwyn. You know him from uh, many television shows, the movie Ghost, whatever. But uh, Mr. Sheldrake's uh, song with Baxter about how they're going to uh, just keep this between them uh, shows what In the Broadway musical Promises, Promises, Chuck Baxter advances his career by offering up his Manhattan apartment to company executives for their extramarital affairs. Here to perform Our Little Secret, please welcome Sean Hayes as Chuck Baxter and Tony Goldwyn as Baxter's boss, Mr. Sheldon. <laughs> Now, Baxter, remember, what is tonight going to be? Tonight, sir, a fun evening. No, Baxter. Tonight is going to be our little secret. Oh, of course. You didn't even have to say that. You know how people talk. You don't have to remind Not me. Not that there's anything wrong. This happens to be a nice girl. Listen, you didn't even have to tell me. Besides, it's none of my business. I mean, after all, four apples, five apples. What's the difference? That's where you're wrong, Baxter. From now on, there is only room for one apple in the basket. Right? Right. All the other apples are spoiled and they're rotten. Out of the basket they'll go. Your loyalty is something that won't be forgotten. And there's one thing I promise you. I can keep secrets too. Except each other That's why We'll never tell a soul What it's all about They'll never get a chance to find out Helping questions I won't answer They'll be gossip Let them gossip We don't care Just put your trust in me it's, it's our, our little, little secret, secret trick, and I'll keep, keep it, it locked inside, inside me, me. Cause, cause it's no, no one, one else's business, business of our own. Anyhow. Cause it's no one 
Now, just to give you an idea about Promises, Promises, in its day, I mean, it was a big hit. The pop music that came out of it, Dionne Warwick is Burt Bacharach's uh, vocal muse. Uh, she recorded the entire score. It was a big hit record. But the problem with it is the tone of the music didn't match the cynicism of the, the original IAL Diamond script. Uh, the Neil Simon version uh, wasn't nearly as cynical. Uh, and today, it just doesn't play as well as it did uh, in 1968 when it was a big hit. One of the, another interesting movie conversion uh, was to take the story of Margot Channing, a 40 year old actress who's worried about her fading youth and the roles that she's taking on the famous movie All About Eve, maybe one of the best movies about show business ever made. And the cynical script again with Betty Davis, of course, and Celeste Holm. And the idea was, how are they ever going to replace Betty Davis? And they went to Lauren Bacall. Well, the story is this young, this young girl, this waif, who's very calculating and knows that she's going to upend the life of this actress, Margot Channing, for her own purposes. In the scene you're about to see, uh, Eve uh, has, unbeknownst to Margot, uh, come in and auditioned as her understudy. And when Margot finds out about it, she goes to great pieces. Now, um, Penny Fuller was the original Eve. Uh, Lauren Bacall uh, had never starred in a musical before. Uh, she said, I can't really sing, I can't really dance, but boy, they really made sh her, pre her presence on stage uh, was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, she really got the bite of, of being a 40-year-old woman whose life was up in turmoil. Because as a matter of fact, Lauren Bacall had had her own personal t uh, turmoils, becoming a widow at 27 from Humphrey Bogart, having recently then divorced her second husband, Jason Robards. Uh, it was an interesting persona uh, that she too understood the fate of Hollywood and how they could throw you away. Miss Channing, if I ever dreamed that anything I did could possibly cause you any unhappiness, or come between you and your friends. Please, believe me. Oh, I do. And I'm full of admiration for you. If you can handle yourself on the stage with the same artistry you display off the stage, well, my dear, you are in the right place. Welcome to the theater, to the magic, to the fun, where painted trees and flowers grow and laughter rings fortissimo and treachery sweetly die. Now you've entered the asylum, this profession unique. Actors are children. We call show You're on your way to wealth and fame Unsheathe your claws and enjoy the game You'll be a bitch, but they'll know your name From New York to Kokomo Welcome to the theater My dear the friendly roaches too welcome to the pinches from the stagehands it's the only quiet thing they do welcome to the philadelphia critics welcome librium and nebutal welcome to a life of laryngitis welcome to dark toilets in the hall welcome to the flop you thought would run for years welcome to the world of and cheers and tears. Welcome to the theater. With some luck, you'll be a pro. You'll work and slave and scratch and bite. You'll learn to kill with sheer delight. You'll only come alive at night when you're 
Miss Channing. One of the interesting uh, stories, the backstories to this, uh, is that originally when the idea of All About Eve uh, surfacing as a, a conversion into a musical, uh, they could not get the original script. Uh, the, the, with the great Betty Davis dialogue that she uttered, uh, none of it was available. So they had to rely on the original book, All About Eve, uh, to write this. Uh, sadly, this is one of those musicals that you just don't see anymore. It was good in its day. Uh, certainly the star power of Bacall uh, drove it. Uh, Penny Fuller, who uh, was really a great actress at being nasty and a horrible a villain attacking the persona of Margot, um, but it just doesn't uh, seem to have a script well enough uh, to be seen today. Now, we all know the jokes about attorneys. Uh, you know, that's always a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, the idea of Chicago, the cynicism of two murderesses, everybody, and it's a, a pretty horrible character. But the character of Billy Flynn, originally portrayed by Jerry Orbach, portrayed by many others since, uh, certainly shows the uh, uh, the hideousness of the way certain lawyers, especially defense attorneys, work to try to get their uh, their client off. Tonight, we're going to bring you some tantalizing parts from each of the musicals who've been selected as the best of the season. You've already seen the opening from a chorus line, and now another nominee, Chicago. Big and brassy. This is a biting and cynical musical version of a 1920s murder trial in Chicago, in the windy city of Chicago. So, ladies and gentlemen, may I present the silver tongued prince of the courtroom, the one and only Billy Flynn. of love, like love of justice, love of legal procedure, love of lending a hand to someone who really needs you, love of your fellow man. Those kinds of love are what I'm talking about, and physical love ain't so bad either. 
It may sound odd, but all I care about is love. That's what it's you. Ba 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 boo boo boo. Ba 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 boo boo boo. Honest to God, all I care about is love. Show me long, long raven hair flowing down about to there. When I see her running free, keep your money, that's enough for me. I don't care for driving Packard cars or smoking long box cigars. No, no, not me. All I care about is doing the guy in who's picking on you. Remember, Chicago, uh, in its original run, uh, was not well received. It was uh, felt to be way too cynical. Uh, did juries really get manipulated by the media? Was everybody really so awful? And it did. It took the O.J. Simpson trial and the revival of Chicago, where people really understood uh, what the O.J. Simpson trial pulled off, to make Chicago into the most the longest running American musical ever. The only musical that has run longer is The Phantom of the Opera, but Chicago holds the record. It has been running for 22 years since 1996, uh, and it is still as vibrant and exciting as it was originally. Uh, Roxy and Velma, of course, the two leading ladies of Chicago, uh, neither of them are great shakes either, both murderesses who get off. Uh, and and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's quite a story about that, too. This was Gwen Verdon's dream uh, to make Chicago into a musical. And uh, she really uh, propelled this, much to the chagrin of her uh, separated husband, Bob Fosse. He has his first heart attack in the midst uh, of the creation of the piece. Uh, she is determined uh, to get this done because she sees this as the insurance policy for their daughter's future. Uh, and uh, it really was, uh, uh, you know, quite a, a project for her. Meanwhile, uh, Annie comes along. And of course, you know, there's nobody worse than Miss Hannigan, the one who wants to get uh, Daddy Warbuck's fortune uh, by uh, lying and coming up with a plot. Uh, to claim that she knows who Annie's parents are. And this is the diabolically humorous moment when that plot gets created from Easy Street and Annie. <laughs> Villains survive too, no matter what the cost to others. And Annie has its villains, Rooster, Lily, and that evil, wicked, <laughs> dreadful, talented Miss Hannigan. Ah, oh, Rooster, how did the two of us ever end up like this on the skid? I remember the way our sainted mother <laughs> Would sit and croon us her lullaby. She'd say, kids, there's a place that's like no other. You got to get there before you die. <laughs> you don't get there by playing from the roof. Ah, oh, no, nah. you stack the aces. You load the dice. Mother, Mother dear. dear. Oh, we know you are. You'll never listen. How can we follow your sweet advice to Easy Street?
Oliver Warbucks. The Oliver Warbucks, the millionaire? <laughs> the billionaire, you dumb. Uh, she's gonna live in that big mansion up on Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue? Yeah. He don't live on Fifth Avenue. He don't. Where does he live? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's one of the great classic numbers of evil. Uh, a good, a good satirical look at bad guys, and uh, the great choreography from Peter Gennaro there. I mean, the numbers really considered one of those great Broadway moments. Uh, if you ever witnessed it on stage, now of course my personal favorite for evil wrongdoing and bad behavior is in Sweeney Todd. Uh, Sweeney Todd, and everybody asks me, Steve, what's your favorite musical? And unabashedly, I'm proud to say it is Sweeney Todd. It's one of the most brilliant pieces of theater ever, ever written. Uh, and the last stage role that I actually performed was the evil guy, Beetle Bamford, over there on the right. The gist of Sweeney Todd is that an evil judge sees a young barber by the name of Benjamin Barker and has his eye on Benjamin Barker's wife. He cooks up, trumps up charges sends Benjamin Barker off to Australia, where it takes him 15 years to come back, renamed Sweeney Todd. He goes back to his neighborhood looking for his wife, where he's taken in by a woman who is now making pies in the place where he used to be a barber. She um, guides him to the judge. Uh, the judge uh, is actually now going to marry the daughter of Sweeney Todd, and Sweeney Todd wants to kill this judge. However, it doesn't quite work out, and she convinces him that what he should do is take out revenge on the entire world. Since you can't get one bad person, the whole world is really pretty bad, so take out your revenge on them. This is Patti Lupone, uh, and when she cooks up the idea of what they should do with the dead bodies they're going to create. But you know me, bright ideas just pop into me head and I keep thinking. Seems a downright shame. Shame. Seems an awful waste. Such a nice plump frame. What's his name has, 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 nor it can't be traced. Business needs a lift. That's to be erased. Think of it as thrift, as a gift, if you get my drift. Now, seems an awful waste. I mean, with the price of meat, what is it? When you get it, if you get it. You got it. Take a risk. Business never better using only pussy cats and toast. Now a pussy's good for maybe six or seven at the most. And the children can compare as far as pace. Mrs. Lovett, what a charming notion, well, eminently practical and yet appropriate waste. as always. Mrs. Lovett, how I've lived without you all these years, I'll never know. Think oh, about dear, it. Lots of other gentlemen will be coming for a shame.
beloved, and desperate measures must be taken. Here we are, hot from the oven. What is that? It's priest. Have a little priest. Is it really good? Nah, it's too good, at least. Then again, they don't calm it since all the flash. So it's pretty fresh. Awful lot of fat. Only where it's sat. Haven't you got poet or something like that? Now you see the trouble with poet is how do you know it's deceased? Try the priest. Heavenly. <laughs> well, not as hearty as bishop, perhaps, but they're not as bland as curate either. And good for business. Always leaves you wanting more. Trouble is, we only get it in Sundays. <laughs> Lawyer's rather nice. If it's for a price. Or does something else now to follow since no one should swallow it twice? Anything that's lean. But then if you're British and loyal, you might enjoy Royal Marine. Anyway, it's clean, though of course it takes up wherever it be. Here's that squire on the fire. Mercy, now sell and cluster, you'll notice it's gross. Looks thicker, more like thicker. No, it has to be grosser, it's green. <laughs> <laughs> Fine for once to know that those are bubble circles down below. See, we've got Tinker. No, no, something pinker. Taylor. Something paler. Potter. Something hotter. Butler. Something subtler. For a lark. Then again, this sweep, if you want it cheap and you like it dark. Try the financier. Peak of his career. That looks pretty rank. Well, he drank. No, it's bank cashier. Never really sold. Maybe it was old. Have you any beetle? Next week, so I'm told. Beetle isn't bad till you smell it and notice how well it's been greased. Stay capriced. Now, this may be a bit stringy. This isn't fiddle player. It's piccolo player. How can you tell? It's piping hot. <laughs> then blow on it first. <laughs> the story of the world, my sweet. Oh, Mr. Dardu, Mr. Dardu, what does it tell? Is who gets eaten and who gets to eat. And Mr. Dardu, Mr. Dardu, who gets the sound? But fortunately, it's all so clear that everybody goes down well with beer. Since Marine doesn't appeal to you, how about Rear Admiral? No, no, it's too salty. I prefer General. With or without his private? With his extra? <laughs> What is that? It's pop. Finest in the shop. Or we have some shepherd's pie peppered with actual shepherd on top. <laughs> and I've just begun. Here's the politician so oily. It's served with a doily, not one. Put it on a bun. Well, you never know if it's going to run. Too coarse and too mealy. An actor that's compacted. Yes, and oh. 
always arrives overdone. I'll come again when you have judge on the menu. Wait, it's true. We don't have judge yet, but we've got something you might fancy even better. What is that? Executioner! Have charity towards the world, my pet. Yes, yes, I know, my love. We'll take the customers that we can get. High born and low, my love. We'll not discriminate great from small. No, we'll serve anyone, meeting anyone, and to anyone. A lot of people say, you know, oh, it's Sondheim. Well, if you are a Sondheim fan and you go to see Sweeney Todd, you wait for that song at the end of Act One, and every Sondheim fan knows every single lyric. I mean, you just wait in anticipation for it. Uh, here they're about to wreak havoc on the whole world, and you sit there and you laugh uh, at what the, they're about to do. Uh, they're, they truly get the prize for maybe some of the best bad guys. Well, I hate to be political, and we know the other night we got to witness our leader playing Evita on the backstage of the White House, but this was the original evil-doing person, uh, Eva Perone, who took over a country for her own purposes with her husband. The last nominated musical is Evita. The scene is the bedroom of Juan and Evita Perone. As they discuss the feasibility of his bid for the presidency, a crowd begins to gather in the street below. are out would be presidents are all around i don't say they mean harm but they'd each give an arm to see us six feet underground it doesn't matter what those morons say our nation's leaders are a feeble crew He lives for your 
It's annoying that we have to fight elections for our cause The inconvenience having to get the majority If normal methods of persuasion fail to win us applause There are other ways of establishing authority There are ways of making you vote for us Or at least of making you abstain Now, you know, Wavina became very popular. It was the first of the popular sung through musicals. This was the style uh, that was emerging at this point in time uh, in, the, in the late 1970s. There had only been one or two prior to that, but the idea of having a musical sung through like an opera uh, nominated musical. Uh, catch everybody's imagination. Of course, you know, if you're looking for a bad character, there's the plant. Uh, and that plant is Audrey too from Little Shop of Horrors, uh, the plant that was going to take over the world. Um, I took my young son to see it at the time. He was about eight or nine years old. And I told him if he didn't behave, I was going to feed him to the plant. He very fondly tells me now that that's destroyed him emotionally for the rest of his life. But in any event, uh, the Little Shop of Horrors, Audrey the plan of two. I'm going to end today with a different kind of a bad guy, and that's an art critic or a movie critic or critics in general. But in the Sondheim musical Sunday in the Park with George that explores the price that artists pay uh, for their craft, looks at uh, how critics uh, also and uh, are that approval that an artist has to look for. Um, the Pulitzer Prize winning musical uh, did so many brilliant things, you know, taking an artist that we really knew nothing about, uh, having a, a, a famous painting at the Chicago Art Institute, creating it live on stage uh, for you in front of your eyes, and then a second act with his imaginary great-grandson dealing with some of the same issues uh, that the great-grandfather had as well. I mean, I don't understand completely. I'm not surprised. But he combines all these different trends. I'm not surprised. You can't divide our today into categories neatly. Oh? What matters is the means, not the end. I'm not surprised. That, that is the state of the art, my dear. That, that is the state, state of the art. art. It's not enough knowing good from rotten. You're telling me. When something new pops up every day. You're telling me. It's only new, though, for now. No, though. Yesterday's forgotten. And tomorrow is already passé. There's no surprise. That is the state of the art, my friend. That is the state of the art. He's an original. Was. I like the images. Some. On. You had your moment, now it's George's turn. It's George's turn, I wasn't talking turns, I'm talking art. Yes. But is it really new? Well, no. It's all collaborator. Oh, yes. It's all promotion, but then that is the state of the art, isn't it? Whoa. Art isn't easy. Even when you have amassed it, fighting for prizes. No one can be an oracle. Art isn't easy. Suddenly, you're past it. A compromise, and then when it's all a gold record. Art isn't easy. Art isn't easy. Look at it. Here's George now. Oh, Come on, George. All right, George. As long as it's your night, George. You know what's in the room, George. Another chromaloon, George. It's time to get to work. George, look, all these lovely people in front of our painting. George. I'd like you to meet one of our board members. This is Harriet Pauley. Oh, what a pleasure. <laughs> and this is my friend, Billy Webster. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Well, I'll just leave you three to chat. <laughs> uh, Harriet was so impressed by your presentation. This is the third piece of yours I've seen. They're getting so large. <laughs> 
Uh, what uh, heading does your work fall under? Most people think of it as sculpture. Sculpture? I like to think of myself as an inventor as well as a sculptor. It's so unconventional for sculpture. Say cheese, George, and put them at their ease, George. You're up on the trapeze, George. Machines don't grow on trees, George. Start putting it together. Art isn't easy. Even when you're hot. Are these inventions of yours one of a kind? Financing art is easy, yes. Financing it is not. I take a year to make A vision's just a vision if it's only in your head. The minute he finishes one, he starts raising money for the next one. No one gets to see it, it's as good as dead. It has to come to light. I put the names of my contributors on the side of each machine. Some very impressive people. Well, we must speak further. My family has a foundation and we're always looking for new projects. Bit by bit. Putting it together. Family is all you piece have. Piece by piece. Only way to make a work of art. Every moment makes a contribution. Every little detail plays a part. Having divisions, no solution. Everything depends on execution. Putting it together. That's what counts. Actually, the board of the foundation is meeting next week. Ounce by ounce. Putting it together. You'll come to lunch. Small amounts. Adding them to make a work of art. First of all, you need a good foundation. Otherwise, it's risky from the start. It's a little cocktail conversation, but without the proper preparation. Having just a vision's no solution. Everything depends on execution. The art of making art is putting it together. Bit by bit, link by link, making the connections. Drink by drink, fixing and perfecting the design. I didn't just a dab a politician, always knowing where to draw the line. Lining up for funds, but in addition, lining up a prominent commission. Otherwise, your perfect composition isn't going to get much exhibition. Art isn't easy. <laughs> Every minor detail is a major decision. Have to keep things in scale. Have to hold to your vision. Every time I start to feel defensive, I remember lasers are expensive. What's a little cocktail conversation? If it's going to get you your foundation, <laughs> lead to a prominent commission, and an exhibition in addition. Art isn't easy, <laughs> trying to make connections. Who understands it? Difficult to evaluate. Art isn't easy, trying to form collections. Always in transit. Then when you have to collaborate. Art isn't easy, any way you look at it. Dot by dot, building up the image. Shot by shot, keeping it a distance doesn't pay. Still, if you remember your objective, not give all your privacy away. A little bit of hype can be effective, as long as you can keep it in perspective. After all, without some recognition, no one's going to give you a commission. When we'll cause a crack in the foundation, you'll have wasted all that conversation. Art isn't easy. Hey, it's the brain. Even if you're smart. A little technical screw you up think tonight. all together, <laughs> and something falls apart. Art isn't easy. Overnight, you're a trend, you're the right combination, then the trend's at an end. You suddenly lost your sensation. So you should support the competition. Try to set aside your own ambition, even while you jockey for position. If you feel a sense of coalition, then you never really stand alone. If you want your work to reach fruition, what you need's a link with your tradition. And of course, a prominent commission. Plus a little formal recognition. So that you can go on exhibit. So that your work. And go on exhibition. Be nice, George. I was hoping it would be a series of three, four at the most. You have to pay a price, George. We have been there before, you know. You never suffer from a shortage of opinions, do you, Blair? You never minded my opinions when they were in your favour. They like to give I advice, your George. Work from the beginning, you know that. You were really on to something Don't with think these light machines. George. In New George, they play to the Blue George. You knew Russia through George. And even if it's true, George, you do what you can do. By bit, putting it together, piece by piece, working up the vision night and day. All it takes is time and perseverance, with a little luck along the way, putting in a personal appearance, gathering supporters and adherents. But he combines all these different trends. Mapping up the right configuration, starting with a suitable foundation. He's an original. Was lining up the prominent commission and an exhibition in addition. Your little dab politician. There's a bunch of publications. What's going on? It's a position. Depends on preparation. Or do you have the suspicion that it's taking all your concentration? The art of making art. Drink by drink, mink by mink, and that is the state of the art. I mean, I don't understand.
Well, Sondheim truly uh, caught that beautifully. Um, I'd love to answer some questions. We're going to look at the chats to see if there's anything. Oh, there's a whole lot of them here. Um, we look at the chats. I hope this... Uh, Someone made a comment about Randy, uh, P Mandy Patinkin, his ability to roll his R's. Mandy Patinkin was a perfectionist. I mean, in A Sunday in the Park with George, there's a scene where there's a dog. And Sondheim tells the story where Mandy came in with 37 different kinds of barks to decide which dog would be the best dog for him to personify in the song. Um, uh, does the Book of Mormon have a scene? Was it in Angels and Miracles that had the Mormon underwear scene? Uh I can't remember for sure. I think it may have been Angels in America. Um, I'm looking through. See if there's. Um, oh, here's an idea for a theme. Men who sing in their underwear. I don't think there's all that many. Uh, going back to Jerry Orbach. Uh, Jerry Orbach, there were some questions about him. Uh, he started his career in the Fantastics. He was the most used Broadway leading man for 25 years, not a household name, unless you knew Broadway performance. Uh, he was originally auditioned for Law & Order, was passed over for uh, Paul Sorvino, and then when Paul Sorvino left, Jerry Orbach was cast. That's what made him a household name. By the way, he played the father in a low-budget movie that became a big hit called Dirty Dancing. Uh Jerry Orbach really was around a long time. People just didn't realize. Um, uh, a question was asked, was it true that a Lauren Bacall was difficult? She didn't suffer fools. She wanted you to tell her the truth. She wanted you to be honest with her. If there was a problem, she wanted to know up front. Uh, she knew what she wanted to do. She was very much in charge of, you know, look, she became a widow at the age of 27, raised two kids, and had to really be in charge of her life. Uh, so I don't know. She was difficult. Lauren Bacall is not still alive. She died about two years ago. Um, uh, I'm just looking to see if there's anything else uh, that needs answered. The original choreography for Cabaret, uh, it was, of course, Fosse in the movie. Uh, let me look that up uh, because I'm not sure. Offhand, it just left my head. Um Typing in as I'm looking. Of course, I'm not typing quickly. I'll have to look it up and get back to you all. Uh, someone sent me a new message down below here. Um, uh, if you're interested in seeing something you missed, uh, I'll tell you that again. Send me an email and I can send you the link. I am recording this one uh, as it turns out. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, we'll we'll tape it. Uh, Lauren Bacall, I mean, my God, I, 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 you know, my wife, Brenda, with my son for a period of time lived in New York at 73rd, 71st and uh, Central Park West. Lauren Bacall lived in the Dakota, 72nd and Central Park West. My wife is out walking the dog with my son. When she calls me on my cell phone, she says, Steve, Steve, she's walking right by me. And I went, she's walking right by you. Can you tell me who she might be? You know, the one that was married to him. I went, oh, Lauren Bacall? Yeah, 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 Lauren. So anyway, that's my personal connection to my wife, seeing Lauren Bacall. <laughs> but in any event, um, who wrote Applesauce? I don't know Applesauce, uh, what that is. Uh, I'm just looking quickly back to see if there's anything else I need to um, answer. Um, I can't quite think of anything. But uh, in any event, uh, I'll send out the link shortly. Uh, for next Friday, uh, I'm finding out that some people's email doesn't like my email server. Um, I know who a few of you are, and I'll try to send it out from an AOL account. But if, you know, if you're not, if you don't have the link by Monday, email me back, and I'll get it to you right away. Because I sent it out over the weekend, and everybody uh, should have it. Uh, and you know, whatever. Um, I'm glad you all are enjoying the series. Uh, thank you all as always, and I'll see you all next Friday morning. Take care. Bye, everybody.